Gwen, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and get us moving because we have such a packed schedule today. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a terrific first panel. I'm Susan Glasser from Foreign Policy Magazine, and I uh, want to welcome you to the second panel, uh, which is a very timely subject, drones and allies. And uh, Peter's going to switch hats from moderator to uh, panel participant for this one. First of all, I just wanted to um, thank New America for putting this incredible conference together and really convening all of these wonderful experts, not only uh, to pull together this body of work, which will stand and which we hope you can see as well on foreignpolicy.com, on the AFPAC channel, which we collaborate with New America on. But, you know, again, just also for including foreign policy uh, in this conversation, I think uh, I can't think of people who have more skill at pulling together the right people for the right conversation at the right moment. So we're just thrilled to be a part of this, and, and, and Peter really is has been a, a driving force in this. I know Steve Call made a plug at the beginning of this, but I promised Catherine I would do the same thing. Uh, for most of you here are probably already familiar with the AFPAC channel, which is our sort of daily online collaboration, but if you're not, I encourage you after this session uh, to take a look at it. And one of the most distinctive things there is this this wonderful daily brief that, that Catherine here puts out. And, um, you know, if you haven't already signed up for the email, I recommend it. It's, it's just a, it's a great daily rundown of what's happening. And, you know, as I'm sure we'll talk about in this session, when it comes to drones and allies, this is a pretty fast moving target. And uh, not only do we have these papers, which give us a deeper dive on what's been happening over the last few years when it comes to events inside Pakistan in particular. But, uh, you know, this is something that's that's in the news every day uh, right now and trying to make sense of current events, trying to understand is this a qualitative as well as quantitative change in our relationship uh, with the Pakistanis at this moment? What does this spate of uh, arrests and killings mean? How does this connect up with events across the border in Afghanistan? So I hope those are some of the subjects that we'll get into in this panel. Uh, first of all, uh, without pr further ado, is Peter Bergen, who you've already been introduced to as the moderator. Uh, I'll, I'll only mention his hat here, which is as co-author of The Year of the Drone with Catherine. Um, which is really just just an incredible look. You can get it outside at, you know, trying to understand, you know, the pace and scale of drone attacks. Uh, what do they mean? What are the legal uh, and military and strategic issues raised by this uh, intensified campaign of war from the sky inside Pakistan? And Peter will start us off in this conversation with his PowerPoint. Uh, next, we'll hear from Anne Stenerson, uh, who is a research fellow at the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. She's the author of Al-Qaeda's Quest for Weapons of Mass Destruction, the history behind the hype. Uh, and she studies the Taliban insurgency, Al-Qaeda's use of the internet, uh, terrorism more broadly, and the paper that she's working on for this terrific series is really looking at the interconnections between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. So we'll hear from her next. And then uh, finally, we'll hear from Stephen Tankel, uh, who is a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Endowment. He's the author of Storming the World Stage, the Story of lashkar e taiba He's researching his doctorate at King's College War Studies Department, and he's written for us, and you can also already pick it up outside, lashkar e taiba in Perspective, an Evolving Threat, uh, which really takes us inside, I think, one of the more untold stories, which is trying to understand that, you know, not all uh, militant groups inside Pakistan are created equal, that there's a, you know, separate narrative and, and history to this uh, that is very relevant to understanding that network and that those interconnections between the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Lashkar, and, and other groups inside Pakistan. Uh, but we'll go ahead and start with uh, Peter and his presentation now. Thank you very much to Susan. Uh, and uh, Foreign Policy Magazine for our collaboration. Um, and uh, thank you very much to Catherine Tiedemann, who basically did all the work on this. And uh, let me uh, just go through some PowerPoints to uh, try and give you some illustration. This is a, an interactive Google Maps that Catherine put together, it, showing the exact locations, or more or less exact locations, of every drone strike since 2004. What's interesting, the red lines, uh, that is the federally administered tribal areas. You can see that only one or two strikes actually came outside the federally administered tribal regions. This is an interesting point. The word for uh, the tribal regions in Urdu, uh, I recently found out, is foreign area. 
uh, which I think is, is quite an important psychological understanding of what's going on in Pakistan. As you know, juridically, constitutionally, the federally administered tribal areas have never really been part of Pakistan, and, so, and, they're, and they're not even seen as part of Pakistan by the Pakistanis. So, um, you know, one of, one of the debates has been, should the drone strikes be, uh, you know, should, should they go into Balochistan, for instance? And I, I think that that will probably be a bridge too far for the Pakistanis. Uh, the Balochistan, even if it's uh, a rebellious province uh, uh, that uh, the Pakistanis have been dealing with since the 1970s in terms of uh, uh, Baluchi nationalist movements, uh, it is seen much more as part of being part of pro Pakistan proper. So I think, the, the, I think it is unlikely that these drone strikes will go out of the federally administered tribal regions. We saw the immense pushback in September of uh, 2000, uh, it was in August of uh, the summer of 2008 when the special forces went in on the ground into the federally administered tribal regions. Kiani said, essentially, if that happens again, you know, we're going to treat it as a, as a major problem, a major incursion into our, uh, on, onto our territory. So I think ground forces, uh, unless you have Osama bin Laden, you know, in your sights and that's necessary, is unlikely. I think also the extending these, these strikes outside of Fatah is also quite unlikely. That does have some implications about what's going on there. Clearly, um, you would have not. You'd have to be pretty dumb to be uh, staying in the federally administered tribal regions at this point, uh, waiting to be on the receiving end of a Hellfire missile. If you're a member of Al Qaeda, I mean, I think it's a reasonable presumption that there's sort of been a reverse migration back into the cities. We saw in the in the 2002 to 2004 period, most of the Al Qaeda leadership was in the ma major cities. That became too intense for them because city living, making cell phone calls, dialing up internet connections, actually revealed the locations of these guys. They made a collective de decision to move into Fatah, a safe haven, and that haven, safe haven is no longer safe. Um, my guess is that the ones that have survived these attacks are, are, are long gone. These are just the numbers on, on the drone strikes. Uh, you can see that uh, in 2009, the Obama administration has authorized more drone strikes in one year than the Bush administration did in the previous eight years. And those numbers have gone up even more in 2010. Uh, we speculate in the paper, I think, reasonably that uh, the really intense, uh, I think there were a dozen strikes immediately in the several week period after the CIA, at the attack on the CIA uh, officials and host, uh, that that was really essentially a revenge, uh, you know, that they're amping up the attacks. Uh, the drone attacks as a result of uh, the, the assassination, the, the attack on the C seven CIA officials and contractors. And so 2010 is likely to be uh, even more intense in terms of the drones uh, than in previous years. We, um, uh, it is a controversial question how many people, how many civilians are dying in the drone attacks. And clearly if we're trying to protect civilians in Afghanistan as part of the, the, it, not only, that, that's our major strategic goal in a sense, is the protection of the population. We should also be concerned about protecting the population in pa of Pakistan, which after all is a close ally of ours, uh, at least nominally in the war on terror. And, uh, and the question of how many civilians uh, are dying is a rather important one, because you have on one extreme you have David Kilcullen and Andrew Exum in the New York Times uh, implying in their op-ed, which is suggesting a moratorium on the drones, that 98% of the victims were civilians. They based that on a Pakistani press reports, which uh, suggested that 700 civilians have died in the attacks uh, as of uh, two th uh, late 2008. Um, on the other hand, you have anonymous American government officials saying completely implausibly that only 20 Pakistani civilians have died in the drone attacks, which doesn't make any sense at all. And Bayatullah Massoud was killed. Along, along with Bayatullah Massoud being killed, it was one of his wives, his father-in-law, and obviously the Taliban live amongst the population, and it, it's implausible on its face that, uh, that 20 Pakistani civilians have died in, in, in attacks that have killed more than 1,000 people by our calculation. So, so you have on one, one, you have the 98% civilian casualty rate, and then Long War Journal, who do, uh, do good work on this, but uh, I think they also kind of lowball the, the civilian casualty rate at 10%. We, uh, we concluded, based on uh, an analysis of reliable Pakistani uh, and international media accounts, that the overall death rate of Pakistani civilians is 32 percent since 2004. Just a word about our methodology. We only used, and Catherine is basically the, the, keep, the keeper of all this information, and when you go to the Google map that we've created, you can click on each attack and find out uh, uh, an, an account of that attack and how many people died, how many people were militants. We counted in each attack how many militants died. We didn't uh, count, count the number of civilians, and then we looked at the overall death, uh, death rate and, and came to these conclusions, which 
um, you can see that uh, in 2009, for instance, uh, there were 120 other non-militants were killed in these attacks. Um, so the death rate is, 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 and in fact, the death rate is, is decreasing. In 2009, it went from 32% uh, down to about 24%. So the attacks have become uh, much more careful, or relatively more careful, in terms of the number of civilians who are being killed. This has important moral dimensions and important, I'm not a lawyer and we don't get into the legal aspects of this, but um, we try and just put the information out there. But certainly Philip Alston, who's the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on, on these matters, uh, has already protested that these, uh, the drone attacks uh, uh, may fall outside uh, the international uh, uh, law in terms of uh, proportionality and these kinds of issues. But, so anyway, so the, 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 the main, uh, I think, takeaway from our paper is that the civilian de death casualty rate uh, is, is, is lower than some have suggested and higher than others, and that you can draw your own conclusions if indeed uh, you know, a 24% civilian death casualty rate is, is, is worth it. Um, but this is one of the, if the drone attacks are so successful, why is it that in 2009, you more, had more suicide attacks, almost all conducted by groups that are based in Fatah in Pakistan than in any year previously. And why is it that you've had this enormously exponential rise in insurgent attacks in, in Pakistan in general? And the same, by the way, can be said for Afghanistan, where suicide attacks are at an absolutely record rate, US military fatalities, etc. And so while the drone attacks are certainly, as Paul pointed out, um, you know, certainly been interruptive to Al Qaeda and these groups. They don't seem to have really uh, put the damper on them completely. And as you know, as, as Bruce Hoffman would say, they're, obviously the drone attacks are a tactics, not a strategy. And we know from the death of Abu Musab al zakari in Iraq uh, that um, you know eliminating certain people doesn't end the insurgency. Quite the reverse. When Zakari was killed, uh, the violence actually kept going up. So those were just some of the uh, some of the some of the data we found. Um, in terms of uh, some other points uh, that uh, we wanted to make in the paper, I think actually that I more or less covered them. Um, just one other, uh, just a quick few other thoughts. Um, in terms of the, what does this mean for Al-Qaeda central writ large? Uh, the drone attacks clearly are putting pressure on Al-Qaeda. Uh, one very important data point, which uh, in Paul's paper is, you know, despite all these guys who are going for training in, in, in the tribal areas, in 2009, we found no evidence of any serious plots anywhere traceable to the Western recruits who are training in the federally administered tribal regions. Maybe we'll, we'll learn more in the coming year or so. But I, I just wanted to draw your attention to three or four other uh, points that are really damaging al-Qaeda. We've already discussed uh, you know, the changing Pakistani public attitudes, the changing attitudes of the Pakistani military. Um, a question from the audience about the recruitment pool. It, it certainly doesn't help al-Qaeda, but uh, support for suicide bombing, bin Laden personally, and, and al-Qaeda, the organization, is the, the bottom has just dropped out of that support. But if Bruce Hoffman were here, he would make, I think, a very good point, which I think Paul alluded to, which is the Brigati Rossi in Italy in the 1970s and the Bader Meinhof gang in Germany in the 1970s had almost no public support and were tiny groups that, put in, in, in both cases, almost brought those society to their knees. So al-Qaeda values one recruit more than a thousand sympathizers. And, and the fact that the p pipeline to the Fatah is still continuing despite the drone attacks. A very important caveat on the drone attacks, by the way, is Najibullah Zazi. Najibullah Zazi was training in Fatah in uh, the period between August 2008 and January of 2009, at a time when the drone attacks had been very much ramped up by the Bush administration. So the drone attacks are, uh, sufficient, uh, are not sufficient in and of themselves to end the threat from al-Qaeda Central in, in Fatah. Thank you so much, Peter. I think I'll ask our other two panelists to come up now so we can go on and... So we'll hear from Anne next. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so what I'll uh, uh, present today is the pre uh, preliminary findings of a study I'm currently doing on the relationships uh, between Al-Qaeda uh, and various factions of the Taliban movement. Of course, there's a lot of ways of defining this, this relationship because there are a lot of ways of defining the Taliban. Um, 
so, uh, and uh, Al-Qaeda for that matter. Uh, so uh, I will focus on two types of relationships uh, in this presentation. Uh, first, I will talk about the relationship between uh, uh, Al-Qaeda or in general the foreign fighters uh, and their hosts in the federally administered tribal areas. Uh, as looking, uh, looking at these relationships uh, from a bit of a historical perspective, uh, asking why they were established and what has kept them together. Uh, and the other type of relationship I'll talk about is the relationship uh, between Al-Qaeda and the Afghan Taliban movement, uh, looking at it from more of an organizational perspective. Uh, and I will also touch upon, uh, at the end, the role of Al-Qaeda in the, in the broader militant landscape uh, of Pakistan. Uh, about the sources I've used for this study, uh, it relies heavily on original sources from the Al-Qaeda network and the other militant groups uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, such as, you know, uh, stories of uh, killed militants, uh, official propaganda, unofficial accounts that are posted on the internet, uh, and so on. Of course, there, is, there are many problems uh, of using this type of source, but I believe they do give uh, 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 an important perspective, which is the perspective of the milit militants themselves. And I think, uh, and I think that's uh, particularly important when we are trying to understand, you know, uh, the nature of relationships and why they were established, uh, seen from... Uh, seen from the militants uh, themselves. Uh, so let me now just go on to the straight to the first topic, uh, which is the relationship between Al Qaeda and uh, the, the tribal leaders and the militant leaders who hosted them uh, in Pakistan after 2001. Uh, I've done a case study specifically of the Waziristan area, north and south Waziristan, uh, and I'm asking uh, the question of how and why was Al Qaeda is, uh, uh, able to establish a sanctuary in this area after 2001. Um, and when we trace the histories of the fighters that came to Waziristan after 2001, um, uh, we see that there have been certain individuals uh, from, from the very beginning and until today that have been actively supporting uh, the foreign fighters. Uh, we have personalities such as Nick Mohammed, we have Batula Masood, we have uh, uh, Hafiz Gulbahadir uh, and others as well. Uh, looking at the backgrounds of these personalities, uh, the main finding uh, or uh, what they seem to have most in common is that they were all actively supporting the Taliban regime uh, in Afghanistan prior to 2001. Uh, this was, of course, uh, not a very radical or unusual thing to do for the people in the tribal areas. You know, there is a long tradition of supporting, uh, supporting their brothers uh, on the other side of the border, which they, of course, uh, do not recognize uh, as a border. Um, and while in Afghanistan, um, many of these uh, tribal uh, leaders, personalities I mentioned, uh, were, were uh, actively fighting alongside the Taliban uh, to conquer northern Afghanistan. Uh, some accounts also claim that they, during this period, befriended Arabs uh, in the training camps or on the front lines. Uh, so they're, uh, so they're, in addition to this you know, shared uh, ideology, so to say, uh, there might also be personal and direct ties uh, between these personalities and the foreign fighters who came to the area after 2001. Uh, particularly clear example is the example of Nick Mohammed, who, who was claimed, uh, who's based in South Waziristan in Fatah, and who was one of the first uh, locals uh, who gave the foreign fighters sanctuary after 2001, who helped them establish training camps uh, and so on. Uh, and he's also claimed to have helped the foreign fighters in their es escape uh, to Waziristan. So in the paper, uh, I argue that the overall reason why these individuals supported the foreign fighters uh, had to do with a sort of an ideological reason, or uh, more specifically what I mean by that is uh, that they both had a shared desire to continue the fight uh, against what they term the occupation of Afghanistan. They both had a desire to su continue supporting the Afghan Taliban regime, which some of these personalities saw, uh, looked upon as their personal uh, duty, so to speak. Uh, so as we've heard before, of course, in the West, we mainly look upon Al-Qaeda as international terrorist organization. We have heard uh, that there is training of uh, militants in these areas that are sent to carry out terrorist attacks in the West, uh, but an additional perspective that I get from reading these uh, accounts of the local fighters is also that for a majority of these foreign fighters, uh, their concern is actually to fight uh, uh, a guerrilla war in Afghanistan. Uh, most of them uh, are not involved in the planning of international terrorist attacks. They're more involved in uh, plotting cross-border attacks uh, and so on, supporting uh, the insurgency uh, in Afghanistan. 
Uh, and this also uh, affects the way we understand, you know, how they established relationships with the local milit militants. And uh, we see that the, there is indeed a, a shared uh, desire um, among the guests and their hosts uh, 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 to fight uh, in Afghanistan after 2001. Uh, that's, of course, a general observation. And when we go into details, we see that there might be a variety of individual reasons for why certain individual tribal leaders, uh, militant leaders on a local level, might welcome or reject foreign fighters in Waziristan. Uh, and pragmatic reasons, such as money, uh, the opportunity to use the foreign fighters to increase your own uh, standing in the local community and this type of thing, that may play a role when we go into uh, the very details. Uh, you probably heard about the clashes that took place between the uh, local population in Waziristan and the Uzbeks in 2006-2007. Uh, this was in fact, uh, you know, it was sometimes described as uh, a general uprising of the local population against the foreign fighters, which was not, uh, not uh, true because uh, the uprising was in fact only against certain Uzbeks and uh, generally not against the Arabs, for example. Uh, and this resistance against those Uzbeks had to do more with local tribal dynamics and uh, also the behavior of the Uzbeks themselves who had uh, made themselves popular, uh, made themselves unpo unpopular uh, in the local, in certain local communities. Uh, the implications uh, we can see from all this uh, is there, uh, most likely there will be elements of the tribal areas that uh, definitely are willing to resist the foreign fighters in their area or to abandon the foreign fighters. Uh, especially in cases where you have, uh, uh, where this ideological element is not so visible, where you have most people who are more concerned with the local, uh, local environment and not so concerned about the fight in Afghanistan, for example. Um, but uh, in Waziristan, at least, uh, when we look, when we want to go looking for these conflicts or, you know, potential people who we might work with, uh, it's important to understand that this is not about the tribes, you know, it's not about the Wazir tribe versus the Mesu tribe and so on, it's on a very local level, the village level, the sub-clan level, and a personal level. Uh, and this also means that uh, uh, in case of such conflicts and we have such tensions, uh, uh, the foreign fighters might simply move to another village within the same agency or they might move, you know, uh, not very far away and find a host uh, somewhere else, uh, which we have seen happening uh, on a number of occasions. Another observation I wanted to mention in relation to the, to the hosts of Al-Qaeda in Waziristan is the, is the meaning of the so-called truce agreements that, uh, uh, that were established between uh, certain tribal leaders and the Pakistani government from 2004 and onwards. Uh, as is obviously well, uh, uh, evident by now, you know, these truce agreements didn't really have any practical implications for the relationship between uh, these local hosts and the foreign fighters. Uh, because uh, because uh, the local hosts did continue to support the foreign fighters uh, uh, in in many cases, uh, and they although they promised otherwise uh, in the truce agreement itself, uh, but that was not uh, implemented. And the reason for that again uh, is that uh, for many of these uh, locals, you know, they they might have an interest in stop uh, stopping the the. the fighting in, in Waziristan against the Pakistani army, but they don't have a very strong commitment to stopping their support for the Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, which uh, they have done for a long time. Um, and when it comes to uh, also another reason why the Arabs seem to have uh, integrated themselves into these communities and uh, been staying there and consolidating their base, is also that they seem to have a particular skill in uh, adjusting to the local environment. We had the example of the Uzbeks who antagonized the local populations and were kicked out of some areas. But uh, uh, in case of the Arabs, we often hear, you know, they function as mediators, they function as advisors, and they're not trying to take up their own space in these areas. And that's a very important skill, uh, which has, uh, which can explain some of the reason for Al-Qaeda's continued presence in these areas. Uh, and after consolidating their sanctuary, uh, foreign fighters, uh, as we know, started becoming more and more, more involved in uh, the insurgency in Afghanistan. Uh, through this involvement, they also established, re-established ties with the Afghan Taliban, uh, which is the next thing uh, I'll speak about. 
And in analyzing the Al-Qaeda-Taliban relationship, uh, I have looked at basically two aspects, which I will briefly talk about here. First, there is the uh, <clears throat> relationship between the Al-Qaeda leadership and the Taliban leadership, uh, Mullah Omar and the Quetta Shura. And secondly, there are the various relationships that take place on an operational level uh, between Arabs, uh, foreign fighters, and various uh, fighting uh, various groups that fight under the Taliban's banner inside Afghanistan. When it comes to the leadership level, we, lo we know that formally Al Qaeda's top leadership has sworn an oath of allegiance to Mullah Omar, which they have repeated on a number of occasions, uh, and regard him as the supreme leader of the insurgent movement in Afghanistan. And I'd like to point out that what this really means in practice, you know, this oath of allegiance does not necessarily imply that there is a command and control relationship between the Taliban leadership and Al-Qaeda. But rather it implies a, a sort of a political uh, relationship in which Al-Qaeda has agreed to not create a rival insurgent group or a rival political party in the future Afghanistan. And this is exactly also what Mullah Baradir uh, emphasized uh, uh, in a statement he made a few years ago when he explained why the Taliban allows uh, foreign fighters in his ranks. Uh, he said that they were volunteers who have come there to uh, fight for Islam, but that, and he specified, but they have not come to create a political party. Uh, so that's, uh, some of, uh, that's something obviously that's very important for the Taliban when uh, allowing these foreign fighters to stay uh, in their area. Uh, or at least having, uh, having an official relationship with them. Uh, and by submitting to the authority of uh, Mullah Omar, uh, the political authority that is, uh, Al-Qaeda is avoiding the same mistake that al-Sarqawi did in Iraq, uh, where the local Al-Qaeda branch uh, that he was leading was trying to compete for power with the local insurgent groups, uh, and uh, we know how that ended. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the, overall impression between, uh, the overall impression of the nature of relationship between the Al-Qaeda leaders and the Taliban leaders is that it's uh, quite a superficial relationship, as, uh, in particular due to the current circumstances in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, the headquarters of these organizations are believed to be located in quite different er areas, uh, the city of Quetta in Pakistan and the tribal areas. Uh, and um, and of course the difficulty uh, of traveling and so on. So uh, what seems to be the case is that these leaders mainly communicate via uh, couriers, via messengers. Uh, and although um, on a publicly the, the these two organizations do uh, acknowledge each other, uh, it, each other's presence, and they uh, tolerate each other, so to say. Uh, but the real relationship between Al-Qaeda and Taliban today, I believe, takes place on the operational level. And that's not the relationship with the Taliban leadership, but rather with the various groups that fight under Taliban's uh, banner inside Afghanistan. Uh, and I did a study of various jihadist sources uh, to find out, for example, in what areas are the foreign fighters most active inside Afghanistan, what kind of attacks do they uh, participate in, and which commanders do they uh, cooperate with? <clears throat> and found that the most active, um, <clears throat> uh, the most active cooperation between foreign and local fighters takes place in very specific areas of Afghanistan. Uh, it's the uh, southeastern provinces, the Paktia, Khost area, and the eastern Afghanistan province, and especially uh, in the Kunar province, which border uh, borders uh, the Fatah as well. Uh, in other words, uh, the involvement of foreign fighters in Afghanistan appears to be highly localized. That's uh, basically the main finding. And we also see many signs that foreign fighters are, uh, in comparison to their involvement in eastern Afghanistan, they're virtually absent from southern Afghanistan, like Helmand and Kandahar, although we have spread uh, exceptions to that. I'd like to present uh, two main reasons why it, why it is like this, you know, why have the foreign fighters mostly been active in eastern Afghanistan after 2001, uh, and with the eastern Afghanistan-based Taliban groups. Uh, one, I believe, would have to do with the terrain and geography itself. Uh, the, the terrain on the border uh, with Fatah is mountainous. It's uh, very suitable for guerrilla warfare. It's suitable for the type of operations that the Arabs and the other foreign fighters know and that they're familiar with. 
uh, as opposed to the desert-like landscape of Kandahar and Helmand, where fighters more likely are more dependent on blending in with the local population and so on. It's a different way uh, of operating. Uh, and the other reason, which is of course interesting in the context of this paper, is that the Arabs in particular have been uh, able to re rely on personal ties and networks that go back uh, to the 1980s, all the way back to the 1980s uh, and onwards. <clears throat> Many of these also continued during the 1990s when, uh, <clears throat> when Al-Qaeda was based in, uh, in Afghanistan under the Taliban. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the most well-known of these relationships is, uh, uh, is of course, uh, that between Al-Qaeda and the Haqqani network. We know that in the 1980s, Jalaluddin Haqqani was one of the first Arab uh, uh, commanders who actually allowed uh, the foreign fighters, uh, in, in, uh, that, that is Bin Laden and the others, uh, to establish bases on Afghan territory uh, in the war against the Soviet Union. Uh, and Haqqani, and uh, primarily his sons today, appears to be uh, the most important, important ally of foreign fighters uh, also today, being in control of the Paktia Khost, Paktika area, and uh, across the border also in Waziristan. Um, to wrap up the presentation, I'll just mention some implications of these findings. Uh, I've argued that uh, Al-Qaeda's contribution to the insurgency in Afghanistan is mostly localized. It's based on personal and historical ties to certain groups and regions, rather than having a close relationship to the Al-Qaeda leadership, you know, the Quetta Shura and the Kandahar-based Taliban leaders. Uh, this indicates um, that the foreign fighters uh, would be able to find sanctuaries, uh, or would be able sorry, to continue the fight in Afghanistan and to find allies, even if uh, the uh, uh, Taliban leadership or other segments of the Taliban uh, officially decided to abandon them. Uh, one could also question, you know, if they do decide to abandon them, well, what would that mean in practice and would they have the ability to implement it, which I believe they wouldn't necessarily have. And we must also remember that some of these uh, Arab fighters have been in the area now for over 20 years. Uh, there are several examples of Ara Arabs who settled in the area after, after the 1980s. They mar got married to local women. And after 2001, also, it's been said that Al Zawahiri uh, has also married a local woman from the tribal areas. Uh, and uh, this means that as time goes by and Al Qaeda is able to continue to have a sanctuary in these areas, it will become harder to sep uh, separate Al Qaeda from the Taliban. Uh, but the localized nature of the insurgency it's, uh, is also a disadvantage for Al Qaeda because it increases the possibility for factionalism uh, and infighting after. Uh, the common enemy has left Afghanistan, which is the NATO troops uh, today. And if that happened, we could have a similar situation to what we saw in Afghanistan in the early 1990s when the uh, civil war broke out between the various Mujahideen factions. Many of the Arabs uh, left the area in this period uh, because they were not interested uh, in becoming entangled in a civil war between Muslim factions. And that's also true uh, for, uh, for Al Qaeda today. Uh, this is obviously a future dilemma for the Al-Qaeda network, uh, and that might be the reason why Al-Qaeda uh, today we are seeing uh, their propaganda is, has increasingly focused uh, on Pakistan. Uh, their, their ties with the Tal uh, uh, Pakistani Taliban uh, seem to have been strengthened and so on. Uh, it appears that uh, Al-Qaeda is trying to insert itself into the Pakistani militant uh, environment. And in Pakistan, it also, it also appears uh, that uh, it also appears as if Al Qaeda is finding a more respe receptive audience for its global jihadi ideology. As been mentioned before, you know uh, there is increasing uh, resistance uh, in Pakistan against Al Qaeda. But you know, uh, uh, as was uh, also said, you know Al Qaeda doesn't need a lot of popular res uh, popular support. They just need a few allies that are willing to adapt to Al Qaeda's ideology. Uh, and we see that uh, uh, that was exemplified through personalities like Badrullah Masood, for example, who publicly supported uh, international using international terrorism as a tactic, which is something we don't see uh, on the Afghan side of the border with the Afghan Taliban, uh, that rather seem to move in the opposite direction of promoting a nationalist-focused uh, ideology. Um, 
<clears throat> so although right now it's still Afghanistan, uh, undoubtedly that's the focus for Al-Qaeda and that's the focus for the global jihad movement uh, because of the presence of foreign troops there. Uh, but it's very important to also keep track of what Al-Qaeda is doing in Pakistan because uh, that will most likely be the most uh, important recruiting ground for Al-Qaeda in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And that was uh, terrific and a perfect uh, teeing up for our next speaker, Stephen, who's going to pick up on that question of the Pakistan-Al-Qaeda uh, connection. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank New America for having me here today and also uh, for squeezing me into uh, this panel. Uh, I know initially I was supposed to be uh, speaking in, in April. Um, I'm going to be away, so thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about some of the evolving threats from uh, Lashkar e Taiba and specifically those associated with its increasing collaboration uh, with Al Qaeda and other jihadi outfits in Pakistan's tribal areas. Now, um, that puts me slightly as the odd man out here since I'm focusing on LET vis-a-vis uh, -vis Al Qaeda rather than Al Qaeda itself. Um, but I think that's somewhat fitting because LET is somewhat of a group apart uh, in Pakistan I itself. Uh, and it's also a bit of a group apart, I think, within the global uh, jihad. We often speak of, of Lashkar as an Al Qaeda affiliate, but I don't think that the group would see itself uh, that way uh, in, by any means. Um, now, within Pakistan, uh, Lashkar Talib is often spoken of uh, as one of the groups uh, that is part of the Punjabi Taliban, and, and uh, I simply don't see that to be the case. The Punjabi Taliban are primarily Diobandi militants, and uh, Lashkar Talib is an Ali Hadith organization. The Ali Hadith is the uh, Pakistani uh, sort of version of, or the South Asian version of uh, Salafi, uh, Salafi Islam. Um, and I, I want to just uh, spend a, a brief moment and, and talk back through the history of LET's relationship with Al-Qaeda and some of the other Diobandi militant groups, because I think it informs uh, the type of relationships and collaboration that exists today. Uh, because, Ali had, because LET is an Ali Hadith group uh, living in, in, in a Diobandi world, by which I mean most of the jihadi groups are, are Diobandi uh, militants, uh, it, it had to rely on building its own infrastructure uh, in Pakistan, and it sought state support to help it do that. Um, and indeed, it was able to build a vast infrastructure in Pakistan, uh, but it's also sought to protect that infrastructure uh, in, in recent years, uh, and that makes it more susceptible to state leverage uh, than other groups. Um, now, because of its Ali Hadith faith, and perhaps because the ISI wished it to be so, during the 1990s, uh, when Pakistani militant groups, like many other militant groups, were using Afghanistan as a training ground, uh, Lashkar Taiba was uh, a bit of a group apart. Although it, it had robust ties with Al Qaeda, um, its main camps were in Kuna province, uh, which was outside of Taliban control. Um, and indeed, some of its Salafi allies uh, in, in that, that area were allied against the Taliban during the 1990s. Uh, LET Cotters, uh, on the whole, did not fight alongside or work closely with the Taliban like other groups did during the 1990s. Um, that's not a, you know, a blanket absolutist statement, but the general practice did not exist. Um, and pr what's particularly important is because they didn't have uh, particularly strong ties uh, to the Taliban movement or the other Diobandi groups during the 1990s in Afghanistan, uh, after 9-11, when the U.S. counterattack took place, unlike most of the D Pakistani Diobandi groups, which deployed militants uh, to Afghanistan, LET did not. And this created additional tension beyond sectarian tensions with the Taliban um, and also with al-Qaeda. Now, it did provide some support to these different actors during the early 1990s, including Safe Haven in Pakistan. Uh, and it also launched what I would term a peripheral jihad uh, against the West. India remained, uh, and I think still remains, its primary enemy. But through 2006, it, it focused primarily on fighting in Indian-controlled Kashmir and against India, um, more so than the other groups and, and to the exclusion of events in Afghanistan and the tribal areas. 
by 2006, that front was closing, anti-Americanism was rising. In Pakistan, the Afghan insurgency was surging. Um, and for all of these reasons, uh, as well as to keep its recruits on side, uh, LET opens up a second front in Afghanistan. Um, and this necessitated its increased presence in the NWFP and tribal areas, and that in turn led to increased collaboration with the different actors there. I'm going to provide a brief overview of this expansion and that collaboration, and then I'm going to talk about some of the threats that are emerging uh, from this collaboration. And then finally, I've been offered to attempt to, off to, uh, to provide some, some recommendations or thoughts on what we could do uh, about LET. So I'll conclude with that. Uh, in the tribal areas, LET works through like-minded groups, and it does this essentially to avoid embarrassing the state with which it still has uh, a relationship, and so that it can plausibly deny that it's involved in any other front than Kashmir. Examples of this include the Jamiat uh, al Dawa al Quran wal Sunnah uh, and the Shah Sahib group. Um, those are just two of, of a number of, of examples. Uh, in addition, through its above-ground social welfare organization, the Jamaat Dawa, uh, it also expanded its presence uh, in this region, and it did this by building mosques, medaris, its own al Dawa schools, uh, and also opening offices, which it used for recruitment and for proselytizing. Now, this expansion, as I said, brought it into greater proximity with the various actors uh, in the region, including the TTP, Al-Qaeda, Afghan Taliban, and other assorted Dilbandi militants. As in many conflict zones, what we end up getting is separateness and togetherness. Uh, LET has been careful uh, at the organizational level to maintain some distance, again, to maintain uh, plausible deniability about its operations there, and also to try to keep uh, control over its own members. Uh, for their part, you know, according to uh, some of the militants within LET I've spoken to, as well as some of uh, people in the Pakistani security services and others, uh, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban still have a degree of mistrust for Lashkar members because of their close relationship uh, historically with the ISI. And local rivalries occasionally have developed into violent conflict. When this has happened, it's generally been between, it's generally been with the, the TTP, not with Al Qaeda or different uh, di other Diobandi jihadi groups. It's happened on several occasions and in one uh, possible collaboration with the ISI by an LAT associated group may have been the cause, though commando rivalry also played a role. But as I said, despite these episodes, collaboration has been increasing since 2006 takes place at the organizational and individual levels. And here it's notable uh, to, to say that although LET remains one of the more directed groups uh, in Pakistan, freelancing among its cadres has increased in recent years. Now, LET-linked groups have highest integration with Al-Qaeda, the TTP, and other actors uh, in the tribal areas in the Bajor and Momond agencies. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, first of all, that's where LET has historically its strongest networks, dating back to the jihad against the Soviets in the 1980s. As we've also heard, uh, these two areas are ideal for infiltrating militants into eastern Afghanistan to take part in the insurgency there. Now, LET also had a notable presence in South Waziristan, uh, and it trained near Al-Qaeda there. Uh, clearly, collaboration is not limited to just a few areas, although it is concentrated in several areas. Uh, now, LET's presence in the tribal areas has been geared mainly toward its participation in the Afghan uh, theater, where admittedly it's not a major player. Its collaboration with other groups uh, takes several forms. First, LET trains on its own, but it also now cross-trains with other groups. Some of its members are believed to be instructing at the camps of other outfits, and it's an LET camps or LET associated camps host fighters from other groups. Secondly, they work together to house uh, militants and to infiltrate them across the border into eastern Afghanistan. Third, LET recruits not only for itself, but it now recruits for other groups as well in the tribal areas. Um, it's particularly worth noting that while the group uh, abjures suicide bombings and doesn't launch suicide bombings itself, it's not above recruiting suicide bombers for Al-Qaeda or the Haqqani network to use in Afghanistan. 
And finally, uh, LAT militants have taken part in a number of attacks in Afghanistan, uh, several of which are, are worth noting. The first is the attack on the U.S. command post Wanit in July 2008. And the second is the vehicle-borne IED attack uh, against the embassy, Indian Embassy that same month, uh, in which LAT collaborated with the Haqqani Network, and the ISI is also believed to have been uh, involved. Now, while LAT still refrains from launching attacks in Pakistan, some of its members are providing support to other uh, outfits that don't practice such restraint. This includes facilitating the movement of men and material through Pakistan, providing safe houses and identity papers, as well as occasionally conducting surveillance or reconnaissance and providing intelligence sharing on targets. Beyond contributing to the insurgency Afghanistan and supporting some attacks in Pakistan, collaboration poses a number of threats uh, to the West. The first is that LET's camps get less scrutiny than others. They get more scrutiny than they used to, but LET can still act as a training provider uh, for would-be Western terrorists, um, and it can also act as a gateway organization uh, to al-Qaeda or other groups in the tribal areas. Uh, it's much easier to turn up at an LET office or Madari, uh, get in with the group, and then move from there to the tribal areas than it is uh, to necessarily just make your way there on your own. Uh, secondly, uh, LET has been a funding provider. The group has a lot of money, uh, and it's used it to support attacks against the West. Third, it's got vast transnational networks that stretch through India and Bangladesh, Persian Gulf countries, the UK, mainland Europe, North America, and it may still have operatives in Australia as well. And it's not been above using these networks uh, to facilitate attacks against Western targets. Fourth, uh, it's worth noting that as collaboration has increased, there's been increased likelihood of cross-fertilization or freelancing by LET members who have worked with other groups. And while it might be possible to deter LET's leadership, it's much harder to, to deter individuals within the group. Now, this is particularly notable because historically, uh, LET has used its transnational operatives primarily to support attacks against India, although there are exceptions. Support for Richard Reed in 2001, the shoe bomber. Uh, support for Willie, uh, Willie Brigitte and attacks in Australia in 2003. Uh, potentially providing financial support and acting as a gateway uh, for the uh, liquid explosives plot against the airlines in 2006. And more recently, the David Headley case uh, where he was working uh, to undertake an attack in Denmark. Um, evidence suggests that this is, is evolving and that LET as an organization and that its individuals are more likely to be involved in attacks against the West. Um, in terms of at the group level, uh, we're seeing more blended attacks uh, that are targeted against uh, Indian interests as well as in Western interests. We saw this in Mumbai in 2008. Uh, Bangladesh, a year later, uh, LET Fedayeen squad sought to target the Indian High Commission and the uh, U.S. Embassy in Dhaka, Bangladesh. This is a big turning point. It would be the first time that LET had actively sought to attack a U.S. government installation and possibly the more recent Pune attack uh, in, uh, in Pune, India. Uh, secondly, um, as I said, Collaboration is increasing, which means that even if LET leaders do not choose to use their transnational operatives to support attacks against the West, these operatives can lend their services to other groups. And when I talk about collaboration, it's particularly worth noting uh, one group, and that's HUJI, uh, because LET and HUJI historically have collaborated on attacks uh, in India. And so the networks between the two uh, have developed over time. Indeed, when David Headley was working to attack targets in Denmark, he was not only working with LET, he was also working with Huji. And when LET tried to steer him towards prioritizing attacks in India, he simply ramped up his collaboration uh, with Ilias Kashmiri, uh, operational commander of Huji. So what can we do about this? Um, first, I want to make a few quick points. And that is that LET continues to offer higher benefits than other militant groups in Pakistan uh, to the Pakistani state and at lower costs. Um, and so for that reason, it's impossible to de-link dealing with the threat from Lashkar from reform in Pakistan, where currently it, it's, I would question whether the will or the capacity exists 
uh, to deal with LAT. Secondly, uh, right now the U.S. is looking for a lot uh, from Pakistan vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban, the Haqqani Network, and other groups, um, which could be said to pose a more immediate threat because of their activities in Afghanistan. Uh, so there's obviously going to be trade-offs and balance in terms of what we can look for and what we can get. And finally, it goes without saying that promoting peace between Pakistan and India and promoting a sense of Pakistani security vis-a-vis -vis India would go a long way towards uh, degrading the threat from LET and its collaboration with these other actors. I'm not going to get into that with the time I have here, but I'm happy to talk about it during the Q&A. Um, I want to make just a few general points about the domestic environment in Pakistan and then wrap up with a few specific points about LET in terms of possible ways forward. Regarding Pakistan, these are not necessarily new recommendations, but I think they are necessary. Uh, the first is obviously strengthening the civilian government, which has shown itself more willing to deal with LET than the Army or the ISI. Uh, where possible, working through the government more and the ISI less would be great. Um, Conditioning military aid on improved civilian control over intelligence agencies, I think, is something else that is certainly worth considering with a medium-term goal of bringing the ISI under civilian control. Uh, secondly, in terms of uh, capacity, I think it's very important to strengthen civilian law enforcement institutions. Uh, for example, uh, the police, I'm not going to pretend that there are not supporters for LAT in the police, um, but that support is not nearly as deep or as institutional as it is in the army. Uh, secondly, the police are going to be the front line for any backlash that happens were Pakistan to really move against Lashkar. Uh, another example is the Intelligence Bureau where right now it's over -re overly reliant on the ISI, which is a long time uh, supporter of Lashkar's. Uh, should be looking to end the process of cross-fertilization, whereby ISI operatives are sent over to work in the Intelligence Bureau. Uh, and we should also be sending more money and more in building up capacity for the IB. Uh, more freedom, that means more freedom to operate. Third, uh, you know, I think it would be well worth uh, considering earmarking some foreign aid for the development of a program to disarm, demobilize, and reintegrate uh, militants in Pakistan to be designed with the assistance of international experts. Uh, I know that the British have offered their assistance in the past. Several meetings were held. Islamabad decided to go it on its own. This was around 2004, 2005. Whether or not these efforts were entirely cosmetic and simply for show for the West is debatable. Um, their efficacy is not. Uh, most of these groups, or all of these groups are still around. LET most certainly is. So. Regarding LAT itself, um, I think we need to accept that we're going to have to gradually uh, wind the group down. We're not going to flip a switch and, and have it go away. And we need to understand that this is probably going to end with some messy compromises, uh, for example, with some leaders potentially escaping prosecution because of their utility in uh, exerting influence over the members. Now, in the short term, I think our goal should be containing the group and degrading its capabilities, particularly those capabilities that can be useful to other actors uh, in Pakistan as well. Now, I'd love to see all LET camps shut tomorrow, but that's not going to happen. Uh, however, aid should be conditional on progress being made uh, against uh, closing some of these camps, as has been mentioned uh, in U.S. legislation. Um, but I'm not so concerned about some of the big uh, ticket items like Marid K, LAT's compound outside Lahore. Uh, rather, I, I'd like to see more of a focus on camps in Pakistan-controlled Kashmir and Mansara in uh, the northwest frontier province, but apart from the tribal areas where the, the Pakistani military is able to operate and could take much more action if it wanted to. And finally, um, I'd like to see uh, I think we need to be putting pressure on Pakistan, um, not necessarily to be dismantling LAT with, within its borders, but to increase intelligence sharing on LAT's transnational networks. Uh, right now, we need to be looking to degrade uh, the threat that they can pose both to the West and to India. Uh, by degrading those networks, we also reduce the threat from freelancing. And ironically, we might actually make the group easier for Pakistan to control in the long term. Uh, we should also be looking to pressure Pakistan to take over all of the groups under the Jamatu Dawa, that's Lashkar's uh, social welfare organization, all of the groups under the JUD umbrella. 
um, and show evidence of real oversight. That's not as sexy as busting up transnational networks or, uh, or closing camps, but these groups continue to provide a lot of money that enables Lashkar to do a lot of the damage that it does. And finally, along those lines, something that we could do in the West, uh, LET is recruiting and fundraising under the banner of Idera Khidmat i Khalk. That's their new relief organization. Um, it should be added to the UN 1267 Al Qaeda Taliban sanctions committee list, which would force Pakistan to restrict its activities. Now, this is going to be, uh, you know, an ongoing process. They'll open up a new front group. We'll have to add it. As I said, it's going to take a long time to degrade this threat. Um, but you know, we need to start moving that process forward. As long as that infrastructure exa exists, the threats it's going to be used uh, exist as well. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Well, thank you, everybody. I know we're running a little bit behind, but we'll try to get at least a few questions in. If you could give us your name and where you're from, uh, that would be terrific. Right up here in the front, we'll start. Uh, hi, my name is Sarah Hussain. I'm with AFP. Um, I wonder if um, any of you could talk about uh, Barada, his capture, his individual importance, both um, in terms of the Taliban, but also maybe Al-Qaeda, and then any conclusions that maybe can be drawn about U.S.-Pakistani capabilities and cooperation as a result of this operation. Mm -hmm. I, you know, there's some debate about whether or not um, Barada was um, accidentally caught, or um, but leaving that question aside, you know, what I think what a, there is a report by Adnan Gopal today and the Christian Science Monitor that about half the Quetta Shura have been arrested. Now, whether or not that's, uh, whether it's half or a third, you know, I, I think this is one of the biggest changes uh, we, we've seen uh, in the last several years. Because if you're a member of the Quetta Shura and you know that Berater, whether it was surreptitious, uh, you know, uh, serendipitous or not, that he was caught, um, you know that he is either about to go to Bagram or Guantanamo or wherever. Um, that's likely to affect your your thinking, because basically, you know, for the last eight years, uh, the Quetta Shura is, I mean, they can run for mayor in Quetta. They've been living there for so long. I mean, so the, changing that dial, um, I think, is, is, is very, is incredibly important. And I do think this is part of a larger pattern. It's not just Bereda, but Mullah Kabir and the shadow governor of Zabul province and, and others who've been arrested in the last week. And there have been more arrests in the last week than there have been in the last several years of, of senior <laughs> Uh, relatively senior Taliban figures in Pakistan. Uh, that, again, is part of this pattern of a, a really changed environment. Yeah. Do you think, uh, Peter, that that's going to affect the drone war campaign? I mean, in effect, right, that's been a substitute for the lack of cooperation on the ground. You could certainly argue that. Yeah, I mean, I think the drone, I think that Catherine and I, I think our conclusion is the drone program uh, has kind of reached probably the outer limit of its utility to some degree. Um, you know, they, uh, if you look at the, the senior members of Al Qaeda who have been killed in the drone program in the last year, I think the number is close to zero. And uh, you know, the, the obviously you've had Bayatullah Masood and and ha Hakimullah who have been killed. Uh, but I, I, you know, Pakistan's a big country, and Fatah is a tiny part of it. So uh, the fact that they're now picking people up in Karachi or other pa parts of the country, I think, speaks. Uh, you know, is, is a major change. And it's sort of a good news, bad news story. I mean, the, Pac the, the Afghan Taliban, by the way, the whole idea of the Afghan Taliban, the Pakistan Taliban is a strange distinction. When they all live in Pakistan, they're all headquartered <laughs> there. <laughs> Many of them grew up in Pakistan. Uh, but uh, the fact that Karachi is now no longer a safe haven and in other parts, I think that is, that's a big change in the last months. Okay, another question. Uh, my question is about, uh, I'm Azmat Khan from CFR. Uh, I'm interested in public opinion in Pakistan on drone strikes, uh, particularly in public opinion within the Fatah itself. Uh, there haven't been many reports, but uh, the Ariana Institute for Regional Research and Advocacy released a report last year that indicated that public opinion against drone strikes is not as strongly opposed as public opinion across the rest of Pakistan. And I was interested in learning more about public opinion within the Fatah towards drone strikes, um, whether you've done any research or analysis um, from those areas and what that might mean, particularly Quorum Agency and Shias living there. Polling in Waziristan is problematic. <laughs> as you, uh, so, um, 
you know, the Ariana poll that you uh, cite is not a scientific poll, according to professional pollsters. And uh, they did have, I mean, there is a sort of inverse relationship between the, 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 the I think the poll might have a grain of truth in it in the sense that, you know, if a, bu if a bunch of heavily armed religious nutcases moved into your neighborhood and occasionally, you know, mysterious missiles from the sky remove them uh, from your neighborhood, you yourself might not be completely opposed to these strikes. And so, um, you know, the further away you are from the Fatah, the probably the more opposed you are uh, to these strikes. And obviously in Pakistan, this issue is immensely, Gallup has polled on this question, 9% of Pakistanis have a favorable view of these drone strikes. So they're immensely unpopular in Pakistan itself because they go to questions of Pakistani national sovereignty. Uh, one of our goals, I think, uh, with Steve Cole's permission, is, uh, <laughs> is perhaps to uh, partner with... Uh, with Pakistani polling organizations that might be able to actually answer this question in FATA because that, that question is not really being properly answered as yet. Mm -hmm. Terrific. One more in the back there. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I'm Efti Khalsan from West of America. I'm partial to the border region service. We broadcast to the border areas you were talking about. My question is, uh, could you elaborate on the uh, composition of resistance to the U.S. forces in Afghanistan? Uzawi, the Al-Qaeda is involved and the Taliban are. And just uh, more on this, the, the foreign fighters staying in the tribal areas of Pakistan also have some cultural factors there because Pashtuns, I mean, they, they, they fight for their guests and also the money is involved in that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. And do you want to take a crack at that one? Yeah, sure. Um, with regards to the resistance uh, in Afghanistan, it's, uh, of course, when you uh, go into details, it's a very complex picture that emerges. Uh, we, we are talking about, uh, on the overall level, we're talking about the Taliban and the Hezb Islami uh, and the Haqqani network as the main factions. Uh, and we have also other groups. Uh, but within those also, there is a lot of, um, there. The, the, uh, you can see a lot of different dynamics coming into play. Uh, one, one thing that's quite uh, quite important to mention, I think, is the dynamics between uh, insurgents and, uh, and criminal elements in Afghanistan, which has become a more significant factor uh, over the years, uh, and much more than if you compare it with the old Taliban regime, you know. Uh, so uh, the insurgency in Afghanistan, you can't really uh, describe it in a very, in a few sentences. Uh, but as I said uh, a little bit about uh, the foreign fighters uh, that fight in Afghanistan, um, it's, uh, it appears that most of them uh, take part uh, in cross-border attacks, cross-border activities uh, from the FATA, rather than actually having bases inside uh, Afghanistan. That's much less common uh, type of activity, although you have uh, probably uh, also examples uh, of that. Um, you have uh, also foreign fighters uh, sort of traveling from the uh, from the uh, tribal areas uh, of Afghanistan uh, in small teams, maybe mixed teams with Afghans, uh, Pakistanis, uh, and foreigners uh, into Afghanistan and sort of doing a tour of a certain area, uh, taking part in various activities. They're not just taking part in suicide attacks for sure or in guerrilla warfare, but uh, these foreign fighters have also been involved uh, in. Uh, you know, preaching to the local population, ga gathering support, uh, issuing threats, uh, and so on. Uh, various activities all uh, in support of the insurgency. Um, and uh, um, what was the second? Uh, no, I, th I think that pretty much covers it. Peter, did you yeah. want to weigh in yeah. on that as well? Okay, I think one more question, and then we'll uh, take a break for the next, for the final panel. Do we have any more? Okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll end it there then. Thank you so much, everyone. Please were terrific.